Okay, so today we're going to look at 3.5, which essentially is doing the exact same types of problems we've been doing all week. We're going to have problems just like this. Find the zeros. And if you can use quadratic formula, you might have to use synthetic division and then rational root theorem. All the stuff that we've learned up until today has been with real numbers. But it works fine with imaginaries. So we just kind of have to review what imaginary numbers are, and then we can get into solving for roots that might be imaginary. But we can use the same techniques we already know. But we have to remember what complex numbers are. So, a couple of reminders about what those terms that I keep using. If you had a problem like this, and I asked you for the zero, what would you say the zero is for that problem? Yep, three. It's three. So, in our particular problem I just made up, three is a zero of the function. If you can take that number, plug it in, and you get zero is the answer. And yes, you can. If you take three and plug it in, you get zero is the answer. So if you think of it kind of like you would in Algebra 1, think of, think of it as like a coordinate. If you plug in 3 for x, what do you get for y? Y yep. You get 0. You get 0. And that's a special point. What do we call any point? where the second number is a zero. Think about if you graph it. Think about where the point three comma zero would be. Yeah? Um, yes, it's the x-intercept. Yep, x-intercept. So this particular point, or this particular number that you plug in and get zero, is the x-intercept, if you write it as a coordinate. If you don't write it as a coordinate, and you just say, well, 3, then you're saying, okay, 3 is a root. The coordinate, 3 comma 0, is an x-intercept. So if you draw a graph, like a parabola, or any other polynomial, and it looks like that, does this graph have any x-intercepts? No. So what that means is, if you have a graph it doesn't cross the x-axis. It doesn't mean that there aren't any zeros. What it means is there aren't any real zeros. Just because it doesn't cross the x-axis doesn't mean you can't solve it. You just can't solve it with algebra 1. We have to use another type of number that we learn in algebra 2. So let's look at, at this one. This is a parabola that's been shifted up one. Remember, when you add or subtract a number on the end, it shifts it up or down. So this has been shifted up one. It probably would look something like this one up here. If we started to solve and get x by itself, well, what would end up happening is if you plug in zero for y, like let's say you tried to find the zeros, you're going to bring the one to the other side. But then what would you have to do on both sides? Yeah? You'd have to take the square root of both sides. You'd have to take the square root of both sides. But the problem we're going to have there is now we're trying to take the square root of negative 1. So this is an equation that you can solve it. There is something you could plug in that would give you 0. It's the square root of negative 1. But the square root of negative 1 is not a real number. So we're going to talk about imaginaries, and that's how you would end up solving a problem like this. So square root of negative 1 comes up a lot. It's, it's probably the most basic square root you can do that has a negative number under it. Negative 1 is probably the simplest negative number there is. So because that one comes up a lot, we write down that i equals the square root of negative 1. And if you ask, well, why? 
Why does i equal the square root of negative 1? My answer would be because it does. Letting i equal the square root of negative 1 is a definition. It's not a, something that can be proven. It's like saying, well, how come parallel lines don't cross? Because they don't. Prove it. I can't. Parallel lines don't cross because the definition of the word parallel is they don't cross. That's just the way it is. So i equals the square root of negative 1. It's just somebody picked this symbol to represent that answer for some reason. As long as we accept that that's true, and everybody agrees on that, then from there we can build things off of it that can be proven, like i squared. So think about if you took i, which is the square root of negative 1, and you squared it. What happens when you square a square root? They cancel out. And all that you're left with is what you originally had under the root. So what is i squared equal to? Yep. Negative 1. Negative 1. And that I can prove, and I just did. If you take i and square it, you get negative 1. That's important because anytime you have a problem, if you see i squared in it, you should always change it to a negative 1. Okay, always. That literally makes no sense. What's that? <laughs> it's literally just made up. You're like, okay, I'm just going to write this here, so then I can write this here, even though this is not indicated anywhere, so I get an answer of negative 1. That's so, absolutely nothing. So this is made up. <laughs> I equals the square root of negative 1. The same way we make up the fact that the word parallel means don't cross. Why? Why does parallel have to mean things don't cross? I don't know. Somebody made that word up and said, parallel is going to mean they don't cross. Well, i is going to equal the square root of negative 1. Why? I don't know. Somebody made that up. But then, i squared, we have a symbol for i. It's the square root of negative 1. And we know from things that you can prove that if you square a square root, squares and square roots cancel, and you're left with what's underneath it. That's not something I'm making up. That, that can be proven. Like if you take 3, square it, or let's do a number that's simpler. Let's take 4, square root it, and square it. Well, if you take the square root of 4, you get 2. And then if you raise 2 to the second power, you get 4 back. So essentially, those two things cancel each other out. Squares and square roots are, are opposites. Same thing happens here. That's a square, that's a square root. Squares and square roots always cancel each other out, and you're left with what's underneath, which in this case was a negative 1. So I can show you why i squared equals negative 1, but I can't show you why i equals the square root of negative 1. It's just, just the way it is. Yeah. What's the difference there an equation? You're just saying that i equals negative 1, or the square root of negative 1, and then the equation itself is i squared? Um, so here, I just, basically here I'm just doing arithmetic. I'm just simplifying i squared. It's okay. like doing this. But you're saying that i equals negative 1. I'm saying i equals the square root the of negative square 1. The square root of negative 1, and that's why you, okay. I'm yep. just wondering if that was an example or if that was two things so anytime that we see i squared, we change it to negative 1. So let's go back and look at that equation I had earlier. Okay, that parabola I had on the last page. y equals x squared plus 1. Plug i in for x. And let's see what happens. What if we plug in i for x? We get i squared plus 1. But what's i squared? Imaginary. Well, it actually is, isn't imaginary. i squared is a number. Yeah? Negative. What is it? Negative 1. Negative 1. i squared is the number negative 1. We just showed that. So that's negative 1. Never leave i squared in a problem. You always have to change it to negative 1. And what's negative 1 plus 1? Zero. Zero. 
So what just happened? We just found something you can plug in and get an answer of zero. If you can plug something into an equation and it comes out to zero, what do you call the thing that you just plugged in? Yep, a zero. A zero. Or a root. I is the root of that equation. Or you could say I is the zero of that equation. So that's an example where the root comes out to an imaginary number. Now, how would you know the answer is I? Well, I'm not worried about that right now. I just wanted you to plug I in and see what happens. If you plug I in, you get zero. So when we write a complex number, kind of in general, it has two parts to it. Here's what a complex number looks like. And that thing that I just circled is a complex number that has both parts to it. It has a real part, and it has an imaginary part. The real part is always the number we write first. The imaginary part is always the number we write second, with an I. And if you're wondering, well, why am I ever going to use complex numbers? You're probably not. <laughs> I don't use them. I mean, I use them when I teach this, but I don't like go sit home, crack open a math book, and start looking at complex numbers. I mean, uh, when I go kayaking, I'm not using complex numbers. And, uh, when I go get gas in my car, I don't use complex numbers. Complex numbers are mostly used uh, in engineering. I'm not an engineer, so I don't use complex numbers. But if somebody is into like really high-level engineering, maybe structural or mechanical, there are uses for complex numbers. You can look it up. You can go on Google, type in uses for complex numbers, and the first thing that always comes up is engineer. But since I'm not an engineer, I read it, and I'm just like, oh, it doesn't really make a lot of sense to me. I'm sure if I took maybe four or five hours and really tried to figure it out, maybe I can understand one little thing that they're talking about. But not being an engineer, not my thing. So we're not going to do any engineering type problems with this. The only thing that we're going to do is practice finding a zero of an equation. Does this equation come from an engineering problem somehow? Maybe. I don't really care where it comes from. We just want to be able to find the zero, and that's it. So it's basically to practice synthetic division, and rational root theorem that we learned yesterday. It's just a different way to practice it using a complex number. Now, some complex numbers only have a real part to them, like four. You could think of four as four plus zero up. There is no imaginary part to the number four. Some complex numbers, like that one, only have an imaginary part. You could think of 3i like this. There's no real part, and the imaginary part is 3. So some only have a real part, some only have an imaginary part, some have both. In Algebra 1, you deal with numbers that only have the real part. Every single number in Algebra 1 has an imaginary part of 0. They don't, they don't use them. In Algebra 2, then the imaginary part is not zero, sometimes. Okay, but these are all just different examples of complex numbers. These first two would be called pure imaginary numbers. Pure imaginary numbers, they have no real part. So what we're going to look at um, to finish reviewing is how you do add, subtract, multiply, and divide. Those are the things that are going to be coming up when we solve the problem about roots. Arithmetic. Now, what, what did I just write on the board? Huh. What is that? 
It's a number? What do you mean, what number? What, what do you mean it never ends? It never ends. It just keeps going. Yeah. It's like this unit of measuring circle that's like a, generally like approximated down to a couple of digits, but it's infinite in the fact that it represents an infinite number. Okay. So, everything when I asked what is pi, tried, they, they, they pointed at that number. They said something about digits, something about a number, something about it never ends. So the first thing people said is that's a number. You show that to somebody that writes Greek and they say, well, that's the letter, that's a letter. They're not going to say it's a number. It's a letter in an alphabet, something. Not an alphabet that we normally use, but in the Greek alphabet, that is the symbol for the Greek letter pi, pi. But in math, we don't think of that as a letter. None of you did, which is what you're supposed to do in math. You all thought of this as the number 3.14. So when I asked what is pi, you told me what it represented. It represents the number 3.14. You didn't tell me what it is. It's a letter. That's what it really is. It's a letter that represents the number 3.14. I is exactly the same thing in math. I would hope you would all look at I when we're doing this lesson and tell me the exact same thing you told me about pi. It's some type of number. Maybe it has decimals in it. Maybe it never ends. Whatever it is. But this, in math, is just like that. It is a number. Is it a letter in some alphabet somewhere? Sure. Just like pi is. But in math, we don't use this symbol as a letter, and we don't use this symbol as a letter, especially when we're doing complex numbers. Because I is that. It's the symbol for the square root of negative 1. Just like pi is the symbol for 3.14. It stands for a number. So, that's how I want you to think of I. If you have a word problem in this section, you would never want to use I as a variable. Use x, use q, use something else. But don't use i as a variable because it's not. It's a number in this section. Even though it's a number, like pi is a number. If you take 5 pi and you add 2 pi, somebody that knows nothing about math but knows the Greek alphabet would say, well, you have 5 of the letter pi and 2 of the letter pi. So how many of the letter pi's do you have? Seven. seven. They have no idea that pi means 3.14, but they know you have seven of the letter pi's, whatever a pi is. Well, we can do the same thing with i. If you have three of the letter i, and you add two of the letter i, you can write it as five i. So when we do arithmetic, Think of i that way when you're combining like terms. You, you can do that. 3i plus 2i is 5i. It's basically like 3x plus 2x is 5x. But in math, x is always a letter. i is a number in this case. It's the square root of negative 1. So what you're really doing right there is this. 3 square roots of negative 1 plus 2 square roots of negative 1. That's 5 square roots of negative 1, which we usually write as 5, and then the i symbol. When we multiply something like this, we're going to end up having to use FOIL. Okay, we have to FOIL it out. And when you FOIL, the last two things that are FOILed together end up being an i times an i. So you're going to end up with i squared. But what did you say you always have to change i squared to? Always change it to negative 1. Um, when we do a division problem, um, we're going to use what's called a conjugate. So I'm just kind of showing you all the things that I'm going to do in a minute. And I'll show you what a, what a conjugate is. Okay, but conjugates are something you use when you do division. 
Right. And square roots. So how do we take the square root of a negative number? Well, what number is in front of x? Even though it's not written there, there's there's a number in there. Yeah? One, negative one. Negative one. So you could think of the square root of negative x as the square root of negative one x. Does anybody disagree that there's a negative one there? It's there. It's just understood to be there if you don't write it. Now, when you have something like that under a square root, this is really negative one times x. You can you can write it with two sets of parentheses, and that, that's how I'm going to do it. It's because the dot's a little hard to see. So it's really negative one times x. So you have two things here. Well, you can split that up into two square roots. Anytime you multiply two things together, if that's all you're doing under the root, there's no adding or subtracting, that messes it up. But if you're just multiplying two things together, you can split that into two separate problems. The square root of x, we can't really do anything with it. But what is the square root of negative 1? Yep. Ah, that's the symbol we use for it. So essentially, what ends up happening is if you take the square root of a negative number, the negative comes out in front as an i, and the x just stays right where it is. So a negative under a root comes out in front as an i. That's the reason why. From now on, we won't go through that reason every time. We'll just put the i in front if we have a negative under a root. And we're going to try a couple examples. Okay, so let's look at, at this one. We have a negative under the root. How is the negative going to end up coming out? Yeah? Uh, for i. Yeah, so the negative comes out as an i. And essentially, you're now left with that point. Okay. What's the square root of 4? 2. So the answer here is you might think, oh, do I just write i2? You can. i2 wouldn't be wrong. But what you're probably going to see more common is 2i. Usually, we put the letter after the number, unless that would be confusing. For some reason. And I'll show you one case where it could be confusing. Let's look at this one. How does the negative, or actually maybe you can just tell me the whole thing. What's the square root of negative 9? Yeah. So that's 3i. The negative comes out, and then you're left with the square root of 9. Could you write i3? You could. But 3i is probably what you're going to see. Let's do this one. Okay, um, Aiden, what does the negative come out as when we take the square root of negative 7? Comes out as an i. And what are you left with under the square root? This one. Yep. i square root of 7. i square root of 7. i square root of 7. And that's all you can do, and that's how you leave it. Now you might look at that and say, well, wait. On the last two, you put the i after. On this one, you left the i before. The reason I left the i before is because if you put it after the 7, it could look confusing. What's confusing about that? That's not clear. So that's very close to being two different things. Yeah? Why is it confusing to put the i after the square root of 7 in this case? Yeah? Okay, so it, it looks like, you know, in this case, we always know i is a number. Just like the Greek symbol pi in math is always a number. So for this lesson, we know i is a number, we always assume it's a number. But even if it's a number, it still looks confusing to put a number right there. 
Why is why does this look confusing? Because it looks like you're trying to take the square root of seven i. Like you're trying to do like i is in the square root. Right. I can't tell if i is supposed to be in the square root or not. Here. If I put it in front, it's very clear it's not, and it is not supposed to be under the square root. This to me looks confusing. So when you have a square root, put the i in front. So there's no question if it's under the root or not under the root. Just eliminate that confusion altogether. Okay. Right, let's look at the last one. Square root of negative 20. First thing we can do, pull the negative out as an i. Now, do the rest of this problem just like you would do square root of 20. Can anybody give me two numbers that multiply together to give me 20? And I would like one of them to be a number I can take a square root of in my answer. Yeah. Five and four. Five and four. So I'm basically going to do what I had right here. Five and four. And once I write five and four, I can split that apart into two problems. So I'm going to write five and four. Two separate problems. And what is the square root of four? Two. So this part becomes 2 with an i, and then we have the square root of 5. So the final answer there is, well, I didn't want to circle that as the final answer. So the final answer is 2i square root 5. Most of the time, you're going to see square roots come up as part of the quadratic form. That's that's when that will happen. All right, let's try adding. So to add two complex numbers together, all we have to do is combine like terms. You can combine reals with reals, and you can combine imaginaries with imaginaries. And if you're like, well, what do you mean combine? How do you combine? You have to look at the problem. In this case, you're combining using the addition operation. So, Brighton, looking at my first complex number, what's the real part? Seven. And looking at my second complex number, what's the real part? Four. four. And combine seven and four using addition. One. Eleven. Try to make sure your i's and ones are different, otherwise you're not going to be happy with yourself at some point. So, 11. Um, how about, um, uh, Lucas, what's uh, my imaginary part in the first number? Uh, you have 3i. And in the second one? 5i. And if you combine negative 3i and 5i by adding, what do you get? 2i. 2i. Okay. So that's all there is to add. You just combine like terms. Subtract it. Pretty much the same idea, except think of this negative as being distributed. You're subtracting everything that's in the parentheses. Okay, so, Lauren, what's my real part in the uh, first number? The four. And what's the real part in the second complex number? And we're going to do what with the 4 and the 6? Subtract. We're subtracting them. So what's 4 minus 6? Negative 2. Negative 2. Okay. Eli, what's my complex number in the first parenthesis? Negative 2i. And in the second one? I. So we have negative 2i, i, and we're subtracting them. What's negative 2i minus i? Negative 3. Yeah. That's how you subtract. Think of that negative as being distributed. Okay, multiply. I already kind of gave you a hint, but to multiply this out, we need to use the distributive property. Some people call it FOIL, but or whatever you call it, that's what we're doing. Okay, so start with 2 times 5. Casey, what's that first part going to give me when I do that out? 10. 
Uh, Kelly, uh, how about two times negative i? Negative two i. And why? What's three i times five? Fifteen i. And Matt, what's three i times negative i? So let's start with what's a positive times a negative? Positive times a negative is a negative. You're not mad. But that's okay. I like the participation. Yes. Negative. Yes. Negative. So positive times negative is a negative. And now if you want to go ahead, um, uh, well, what's 3i times negative i? I already got the negative, so just tell me 3i times i. It would be 3 i Yes. Good. So 3i times negative i is negative 3i squared. All right. So we've got 10. Um, what's negative 2i plus 15i? Yep. 18i. 13i. And now 3i squared. So I have minus 3i squared. What's i squared? Yep, man. Negative one. It's going to be negative one. Negative one. So what we really have at the end of that problem is three times negative one. What's three times negative one? Negative. So we still have this negative in front. That's from here. This negative is from here, i squared. So minus a minus turns into what? Positive. So really what we have is 10 plus 3, and then we have 13i. Just a coincidence, it's 13 and 13, that usually doesn't happen. But that's, that's how you multiply. Any question on that? All right, and... Let's look at divide. So in order to divide, we have to use what's called the conjugate. Okay, the conjugate is, is very simple. If you have a number and you want to know the conjugate, all you have to do is take the real part and change the sign of it. That's what negate means. Negate means make it the opposite. If you don't do anything, to that part. All you do is take the imaginary part, and if it was a plus, you would make it a minus. If it was already a minus, you would make it a plus. That's the claim. Change the sign of the imaginary part, leave the real part the same. So if I had 3 plus 2i, what would be the conjugate? Yep. Yes. What if it already was a minus? What if I had 4 minus 5i? What would be the conjugate? Right? 4 plus 5i. 5. 4 5 I'm not doing anything with this yet. We're just practicing finding it. So 4 plus 5i. How about 3i? Yeah? Negative 3i? Negative 3i. Think of this one as 0 plus 3i. The conjugate is 0 minus 3i which is just minus 3i. What about 6? Yeah, it should be 6. Think of this one as 6 plus no imaginary part. The conjugate is 6 minus no imaginary part. Well, plus 0 minus 0, same thing. So the conjugate of 6 is 6. Any question on how to find a conjugate? Okay, so where does the conjugate come in handy? Well, I'm not going to go through a separate example, 
But if you were to multiply these two together, 3 plus 2i and 3 minus 2i, all the i's would disappear. And all you would be left with, if you multiply these together, is the number 13. You don't have to worry how I did it so quickly, but if I multiply these together, the answer would be 13. All the i's cancel somehow. If I multiply these two together, I'd be left with 16 plus 25, which is 41. So multiplying these together would give me the number 41, and there'd be no i left in the problem. You would FOIL it, and if you FOILed it, you would see that it is 41. And that comes in handy when we have to do division, because when we have a division problem, you're not allowed to leave an i at the bottom, just like you can't leave a square root. So how are we going to get rid of an i that's in the bottom? I's in the top are fine, just not in the bottom. Well, this is how you get rid of it. To divide two complex numbers, you multiply the top and the bottom by the conjugate of what's in the bottom. And by multiplying by the conjugate, it's going to get rid of the i. Don't care about the conjugate of the top. All I care about is the conjugate of the denominator. So what, what is the conjugate of the denominator here? Yep. 2 plus 3i. That's what you're going to multiply everything by. Now, I'm going to tell you what the bottom would come out to. Well, no, I'll just show you this time. I can tell you it's going to come out to 13. I already know what the bottom is. The top, I don't know. I have to FOIL it all. But the bottom, I can tell you that it's going to be 13. Here's one. What's 2 times 2? Two? 4. What's 2 times 3i? 6i. What's 2 times negative 3i? So, when you're FOILing conjugates, you don't have to do the outer and the inner. That makes it easier for me to do in my head. That's how I've been doing it because they're going to cancel every time. Now, uh, negative times positive gives me negative. And what's 3i times 3i? 9i squared. So I have 4 minus 9i squared. But what's i squared? Yeah? Beautiful. So basically it's 4 minus 9 times negative 1. What's 9 times negative 1? Negative 9. Negative 9. What's 4 minus negative 9? 13. That's how I'm getting 13 so quickly. I'm basically just taking this number in my head, squaring it. I'm taking this number in my head, squaring it. And I'm basically jumping right to the last step of FOIL because everything else is going to cancel. If you doesn't make sense to do that shortcut, that's fine. Just foil it out every time, and you'll all you'll get the right answer that way. Four plus nine gives me thirteen. Yeah. So when you do that shortcut, are you no matter what adding the two together? You're always adding, yep. Right. You're always just taking the number that's here, taking the number that's here. Square the first number you get four, square the second number you get nine. And then you add them. That's how I said this one was 41. Uh, I think it was 16, 25. 16 plus 25 gives me 41. 9 plus 4, actually we just did that one, gives me 13. Now the top, we just have to do it up. So 5 times 2 is 10. 5 times 3i, just put that up there for a second. That's 15i plus 2i. What's 15i plus 2i? 17i. Positive i times positive 3i. What's a positive times a positive? Positive. And what's i times 3i? 3i squared. But that's really minus 3. Because that's 3 times negative 1. Now we have 7 plus 17i, 
over 13. And the last thing is kind of a just a simple, quick thing that they usually do when they write the answer. They write it as two separate fractions. All you have to do to do that is this. Put the 7 over the 13. Put the 17 over the 13. Separate. That's how you separated it to two. You can leave the I in the top if you want, right next to the 17. They usually just put it in front of the whole thing. And that's that's how you write the final answer. Split into two fractions. Um, would you, uh, like, say the, the non-I number was 4 and the denominator was 8. Would you then make that one half? Yeah, if you get a fraction that you can reduce, yep, you'd reduce it, but 7 and 13 are both prime, so yeah. I'm done. But if you, the I can right? Yeah, if you had, like, 12i over 16, yeah, you can reduce that. You can reduce any fraction that has common factors in the top and bottom. That would be like 3 fourths i. Okay. And that's division. Any question on division? All right, so now we'll finish up by finding a few zeros of equations. And they may come out imaginary. So if they come on imaginary, they come on imaginary. So. Well, the first thing I would always try to do with something that's quadratic is factor. But can you think of two numbers that multiply to give you 1 and add to give you 1? Is that possible? No. The only things that multiply to give you 1 are 1 times 1. And 1 plus 1 doesn't add to 1. So. What else can we do if we can't factor it? Yeah? Quadratic formula. Yep. What's A in this case? 1. B? 1. C? 1. All right. So we get all 1s to A, B, and C. Just fill it in and see what we get. So negative B plus or minus the square root of B squared minus 4 times a times c over 2a. What's 4 times 1? 1 or 4. Times 1? 4. And what's 1 minus 4? Negative 3. Negative 3. And how, the only thing we have to do is write the square root of negative 3. How do you write the square root of negative 3? Max? I square root of 3. I square root of 3. And there you go. There's your answers. So it's just a little bit different because it's still quadratic formula. You just have to know how to simplify the square root. I square root of 3. Any question on that one? Yes? I know you didn't write it, but in the first part of the squaring or getting the square root, you have to raise that to the second, right? So yes, this would be b squared, but b is 1, so it's still 1. Okay, so yeah. I just want to double check. Yep. So, look back at these two answers. If I write it the way I've been telling you, this is how it would look. That's separating it into two fractions, just like we did this last division problem. We separated it into two. So the two answers to this problem are negative 1 half plus square root 3 over 2i. Negative 1 half minus square root 3 over 2i. These two answers that we just got are conjugates. Something plus something, something minus something. That's not just a coincidence that these are conjugates. Anytime you solve a problem with quadratic formula and you get an answer that has an imaginary, the answers are always conjugates, which is kind of nice because if you know, let's say I gave you a problem and I said 3 plus i is one of the answers. The other answer is automatically 3 minus i. So it's like you get two answers automatically when you solve a complex problem. Complex answers always occur 
in pairs. Always. What kind of pairs? Conjugate pairs. You can never solve a polynomial and get a single complex answer. You can get two, you can get four, you can get six, you can get eight, but you can't get an odd amount. They always come together in pairs. Conjugate pairs. So everything that uh, everything that we've learned this week, the remainder theorem, synthetic division, uh, we don't really do long division with complex numbers, but other, the other things that we've learned, they all work with complex numbers. So we're going to try an example um, where we find the roots, just like we did with this, this last one, and see what happens. Uh, that. All right, let's try this one. Find all the roots of x cubed minus 1. Now, this is a cubic. We don't like cubics. We don't have formulas for cubics. So we have to turn this cubic into a quadratic somehow. The only way we can turn it into a quadratic is to use synthetic division. How are we going to figure out the number, or maybe generate a list of possible numbers that could go in this spot. What do we use to get a list of possible numbers? Rational roots. Mm -hmm. Use the rational root theorem. And there are not that many options here. P is the constant. Q is the leading coefficient. My constant is negative 1. What are all the numbers that are factors of negative 1? Plus or minus one. Plus or minus one. Q are the factors of my leading coefficient. What are all the factors of the positive one? Yep. Plus or minus one. Plus or minus one again. So now, I wouldn't say that it's typical you all have something this simple all the time, but so possible rational roots. I'm trying to figure out the number to put right here. That's what we want to know. If I take all the p's and all the q's and divide p by q, what are all the different possible rational roots I get? Yep. It's just one and negative one. It's just one and negative one. Now, there's so few rational roots, and this formula is so simple that I can probably check each one of these quicker by just filling them in for x and seeing which one of them comes out to zero, then taking the time to actually graph it and look at the screen. Let's try plugging in 1. What's 1 cubed? Yeah. 1 minus 1. Yeah. 0. So I know that 1 is a root. I don't even have to graph it to see that. I can plug it in and check it faster. If that was a really long formula and this was the number like 3 over 2 or something, well, then it's harder for me to do that in my head. I would graph it on the calculator and narrow the list down. But I can tell 1 is an answer. Okay, so we have 1 as a root. That's the number that's going to go on the outside. And what would be the numbers that go inside? 1, negative 1, 0. Now, since I already know it's a root, what am I going to get for a remainder? Zero. I already know the remainder is zero. I'm not interested in the remainder. What I'm interested in is what's going to end up right here. I want to know the quotient, and then I need to solve that for the other two answers. So let's see what it is. I'm down to one. What's one times one? one. Zero plus one? One. One, one times one? And then 0 plus 1. Let's just confirm the remainder. 1 times 1. Negative 1 plus 1. As we expected. Okay, so this is our quotient. Well, how would you write this out? What does 1, 1, 1 mean? x2 plus x 
is 1. So now you take your quotient, which should have a smaller exponent than what you started with. That's the whole point of trying to make this exponent smaller. It is smaller. It's now a 2 instead of a 3. And we would set that equal to 0 and solve it. But look at the equation we have to solve. x squared plus x plus 1 equals 0. x squared plus x plus 1, we already did it. From, from here, it's now example 4. So the last part of this problem would be to do what we just did in example 4 and solve this using quadratic formula. So I'm not going to go through it again. We already have the two answers. Negative 1 half plus or minus root 3 over 2 i. Those are the other two answers. So synthetic division works exactly the same as it did with complex numbers, or regular numbers. So you still use rational root theorem, you still use quadratic formula. If you have a problem that starts with a 2 as the exponent, you can jump right to quadratic formula or package. If you have a problem that has a 3, then you have to use rational root theorem and synthetic division first, like we did in this one. This comes from example four. That, that part we already did in example four. The exact, like not even like a similar problem, we did that exact problem. Okay, and we had one left. Uh, we're not going to do that. Is it a rectangle? Um, well, that I should tell you. Um, so the number of answers that you get is always the same as the highest x one. If you have an x cubed problem, you should be writing down three answers. If you have an x squared problem, you should always be writing down two answers. So the, the number of answers that you get is equal to the degree, always. Total number of zeros equals the degree of the polynomial, and I'm just going to add the total number of factors equals the degree of the polynomial. So if you had an x squared problem and you wanted to factor it, it's going to look something like this. Two sets of parentheses. If you had an x cubed problem, and you want it to factor it. It's going to look like that. Three sets of parentheses. So factors, zeros, roots, x-intercepts, all the same, same thing. Okay, and we can practice a couple more of those tomorrow if, um, if we need to during the during the moment. Okay, um, let me just double check that real quick. Um, one through three, that's just basic arithmetic. Let's just do nineteen and So that's uh, that's something. 
34, um, 32, it looks confusing what they write. The directions for 32, I can sum it up in one word. 32 is fact. That's what they want you to do. Fact of the problem. So we'll uh, take a look at that tomorrow.